Welcome to another episode of the Megan Spotlight series, in which we focus on topics revolving around magnetoencephalography, research conducted in the MEG field and discussion about utilization of MEG in treatment of patients diagnosed with neurological disorders. Today, we are delighted to have Fernando Maestu, the lab director for cognitive and computational neuroscience as our guest. The lab is an interdisciplinary research group at the Center for Biomedical Technology of Madrid. Hello, Fernando. Thank you for joining us today. Hello. You've been involved in many extremely interesting studies around dementia that have required the use of MEG technology at the lab. So today, we are hoping to find out a little more about these. So let's start with our first question. For which major research task do you use MEG and why? So we typically use uh, MEG for doing research on dementia, but as well we do uh, binge drinking uh, uh, studies uh, as well as stroke and depression. These uh, four uh, major diseases we are uh, uh, taking a look or doing research in our laboratory. But why we are doing aging uh, research? Because it's a growing demand in our societies, the number of, of elderly people and uh, uh, the, the number of people with dementia diseases is growing uh, in, in our society. So th it's very important to have a, a biomarker to understand who is uh, uh, having a successful aging and why. So what are the the mechanisms, the brain mechanisms that protect you for having dementia or not, or or uh, even for uh, modifying lifestyles in, in the aging uh, process. So uh, MEG is providing really good and interesting uh, biomarkers for understanding all these mechanisms in aging. And this is exactly why we are using this technique for, for doing research in, in healthy and pathological aging. So how do you use the data retrieved from MEG technology to support your Alzheimer's disease research? Uh, first of all, because uh, MEG is a very well tolerated uh, uh, technique for elderly people. They can be seated in seated position. Uh, it's a non-invasive and non-noise uh, uh, environment. So this is really good for, for them. Uh, sometimes when uh, elderly subjects come to the MEG, they say, okay, this is totally different than fMRI. You have to be in a lying position for a long time, and they have very hard times for, to, to breathe inside the, an fMRI. So they, they are here in the images in a seated position with no noise. So this is a good, very good environment uh, for, for them. But mainly we use MEG not just because it's a friendly technique, as we all know, is uh, more because of it provides uh, this uh, ability to uh, evaluate the oscillatory activity of the brain. This is really important because then we can see uh, this uh, activity in frequency bands and we can calculate networks. This is really important for our, our research. Uh, because the functional network disruption is a, a clear sign uh, associated with a cognitive decline. So if the brain cannot communicate in the normal uh, way in between different regions, then uh, the subjects will experience uh, memory problems, executive functions problems, or language uh, problems. So the functional network uh, disruption is uh, clearly, clearly linked to cognitive uh, decline. This is why we are uh, mainly using uh, this, uh, this type of analysis. And what we have found uh, from this, this we are typically uh, able to differentiate between uh, mild cognitive impairment and controls. We can even able, uh, we are even able to uh, predict who of the MCI patients will uh, develop uh, dementia. This uh, uh, network disruption is really well correlated with uh, uh, tau protein, amyloid uh, proteins, uh, brain atrophy. So it, it goes very well with the typical uh, biomarkers of, of the disease. And we even have found recently uh, alterations of these uh, functional networks in, in relatives of Alzheimer's disease patients. They were in their 50s uh, and even 20 years before the typical age for the development of dementia, they saw 
already some uh, network uh, disruptions, not as hard as MCI patients, but it is a, a way to say, okay, we can even classify people uh, for uh, clinical trials based on network disruption. So how do you see the future of MEG progressing in comparison with other neuroimaging techniques, including EEG? This is really a good question. So what we need in, in dementia is a good tool for a non-invasive tool, I will say, uh, for diagnosis, prognosis, and as well for tracking the effectiveness of the interventions. This is really uh, needed for in, in, the, in, the, in the dementia uh, field. If we compare uh, MEG with uh, EEG, uh, EEG is a great tool, I have to say. Uh, there is no doubt about that. But however, MEG, when you go to the source space and do functional connectivity, uh, uh, MEG is clearly a superior uh, with a higher uh, spatial uh, resolution and providing then uh, better results indicating which areas of the brain, for example, uh, anterior cingulate cortex, precuneus, typical regions for uh, 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 altered in, the, in this disease, we, you can identify that in particular frequency bands, and probably with EEG, it's very hard to, to do it. And a um, very important a new feature that we are all investigating uh, more and more is the epileptogenic activity in the brain of MCI patients. This, is, uh, this uh, kind of activity seems to have a very important clinical role because it can predict who will develop or not dementia or is indicating uh, the, the uh, alteration in, in the brain. Uh, these are, uh, this epileptogenic-like activities sometimes cannot be easily detected with EEG. However, with MEG, you can detect it much uh, easily. So uh, this is a, a great advantage uh, uh, found in the, in, the last, in the last years with, with uh, MEG in comparison with EEG. But if we compare, of course, with, uh, with um, uh, functional uh, MRI, uh, well, functional MRI cannot do uh, networks in, in frequency bands and cannot detect uh, epileptogenic activity. So end of the story for, for, for this disease, this very important network in frequency bands because you have to detect uh, the direct neuronal activity associated with synaptic dysfunction. This is really, really important in this, in this disease. When we are talking about other modalities like, like PET, we have found, and other groups have found as well, a uh, very nice correlation between MEG findings and, 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 and amyloid PET, for example, or tau PET, indicating that probably you better go first for MEG to test uh, whether there is a network disruption. And, is, and if that happens, then you, you go to the more expensive and invasive uh, uh, test like amyloid uh, or tau PET. That, that, that is my understanding of the collaboration between uh, techniques. Uh, what specific results that you have achieved in your MEG studies would you like medical doctors to take into account when faced with Alzheimer's disease patients? Typically, uh, MDC, uh, magnetoencephalography and functional network as a really research tool more than a clinical tool. And, uh, and this is because of the complexity of, of the analysis that they have to do uh, for, for achieving this uh, biomarker, like functional connectivity disruption. However, in the, uh, we are developing and other groups are doing the same as well, uh, uh, out, fully automatized uh, ways to uh, do functional uh, connectivity analysis. This will pr provide a very easy uh, a tool, finally, for uh, analyzing the data, the MEG data, and probably medical doctors has not to take much decisions or don't need uh, the, the help of engineers or physicists to analyze the data. So this Full automatized uh, programs are really important for, for, for the Alzheimer's disease uh, research uh, with MEG. Actually, the, the European Union have uh, found us a, a, a project, uh, a, a 14 million euro project for doing exactly this, to develop a uh, full automatized uh, method for uh, network analysis in Alzheimer's uh, disease. 
if this uh, project comes with a, a really uh, a, a full automatized tool, that will be a great advantage and medical doctors will use this uh, a lot. Uh, I, that, is my, that is my feeling because then they can uh, easily interpret the results but uh, probably they cannot do the analysis by themselves. These uh, fully automatized uh, protocols will help a lot for having MEG in the clinical scenario. And have you seen evidence of medical professionals using MEG data when treating Alzheimer's disease patients? And do you know what the outcome was? This is, this is very interesting because more and more uh, uh, MDs are trying to look for new biomarkers. This is, this is because uh, 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 other biomarkers they have been using are not as useful or do not provide uh, very good results in early stages of the disease. So when, when the diagnosis is very hard, is in the very early stages, when the patients start with subjective uh, uh, cognitive complaints and things like that, this is really hard to they don't have a brain atrophy. Sometimes they don't even have jet amyloid deposits. So they need something else. So they are starting asking, uh, at least in our environment, uh, can you can you provide some some other data? Can you provide some other medical evidence of disease? Because we don't have anything. I mean, uh, these uh, subjects that are complaining about their memories, they perform perfectly on neuropsychological tests. So they need something else. And, and we know they, these people that complain about the memory, a high percentage of them will develop MCI or Alzheimer's disease at some point in time. So they need something else. So probably MEG could play a very good role in really early stages of the disease when the diagnosis is, is hard and there is no other alternative. So, and the last question we have today is, how would you describe the future of MEG technology in your research field? And what are your plans in relation to extending the use of MEG in the lab? I see MEG as a great tool for, for, for the future. I mean, for the present, but probably for the future. I mean, the fact that the maintenance costs have been reduced a lot for the reduction of helium consumption, uh, as well as the development of, of these uh, automatized uh, tools for, for clinical uh, diagnosis. I think both uh, together uh, are helping a lot for having new clinical applications. Uh, and this is very important. MEG has to go beyond epilepsy. It's, uh, it's playing a really good uh, role in, in epilepsy, but has, has to extend its role in other uh, clinical the, the, uh, neurological disorders. And I think uh, dementia is a really the, the, a good one because there are still a lot of confusion for diagnosis in, in early stages. And more importantly, MEG could be a great tool for uh, tracking uh, different interventions in clinical trials. So if if there are some laboratories developing a, a good drug for, for this disease and they wanted to use it in early stages, MEG is a great tool for, for tracking and evaluating this successfully of, of, the, of the intervention, as well as in non-pharmacological interventions like um, physical activity, uh, diet, or cognitive therapy. Uh, MEG is uh, as, as well a great tool for, for evaluating the improvements of these uh, uh, changes in, in lifestyle. So I see MEG as a, as a great tool for uh, um, cognitive disorders in general and specifically in dementia. Fernando, thank you so much for taking time for us today. The number of people with Alzheimer's disease, vascular dementia and other types of dementia is set to double over the next 30 years, so your research offers hope. It is only through the research that we can understand what causes the disease and develop effective treatments, improve care, and hopefully one day find a cure. Um, it was an extremely informative insight into the world of MEG utilization at the Center for Biomedical Technology of Madrid. So thank you very, very much for your time today. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you. Thanks.